Welcome to Flip Roundtable. My name is Kim, your host for today's discussion. We already passed the first half of this year with markets such as Taiwan, Japan, the US and India seeing double-digit returns. In contrast, ASEAN markets like Thailand, Indonesia, the Philippines and China continue to lag. Back home, Malaysia registered a 9.3% return as of 30th June 2024 with the small and mid-cap indexes faring better. What's the outlook going forward? Today, we are honored to have three distinguished speakers joining our discussion. Let's welcome Mr. Andrew Sia Sekwing, Head of Domestic Equity and Funds Management, Berhad, Mr. Lee Tianjuan, Portfolio Manager, Global Equity Team, Nomura Asset Management, Malaysia, and Mr. Hang Tua Bin Amin Tajudin, Acting CIO, PMB Investment, Berhad. Allow me to introduce the speakers. Andrew Xia Sekwing, Head of Domestic Equity and Funds Management Berhad. He's the Head of Domestic Equity at M Funds Management Berhad and is responsible for managing and overseeing the conventional domestic equity portfolios. He has over 25 years of investment experience in fund management, brokerage, and insurance industries. Prior to this, he was a Head of Equity at a foreign-owned insurance company, managing its equity investments. In addition, Andrew has nearly a decade of experience in one of the prominent local fund management houses as a lead portfolio manager. He holds a Bachelor of Social Science from UC Science Malaysia, majoring in economics. He also holds a CMSI license for the regulated activity of fund management. Our second speaker is Mr. Lee Tianjuan. He's a portfolio manager, global equity team at Nomura Asset Management Malaysia. He joined Nomura Asset Management Malaysia as an investment executive in November 2020. Prior to joining the company, he gained some investment research experience with the incorporation of ESG factors through some internship at River Water Partners uh, in the United States. Tianjuan graduated with a Bachelor of Degree in Finance, Investments and Banking at UC of Winkelstein, Madison. Lastly, Tianjuan is a CFA Level 3 candidate. Our third speaker is Mr. Hang Tua Bin Amin Tajudin, Acting CIO, PMB Investment Manager, Berhard. Enche Hang Tua was appointed as a Senior Manager Fixed Income at PMB Investment, Berhad, in September 2023. He was later appointed as Acting CIO in June 2024. Prior to that, he holds the position of Vice President in Treasury and Capital Market Department at Chagamas Berhad, overseeing the Fixed Income Portfolio Management and Product Development at Vice President at Islamic Treasury, Group Treasury Division at OCBC Al Amin Bank Berhad. He started his career at Bank Negara Malaysia in 1999 in Insurance Regulation Department and afterwards in Investment Operations and Financial Markets Department. Anjik Hang Tua graduated from the University of Bristol, UK, with a Bachelor of Science in Degree in Comics and Accounting. He's currently holding the CFA Charter and is a member of the CFA Institute USA. Let's start with the first question. Uh, Mr. Andrew, uh, there are a lot of talks on red card, but if the red card expectation doesn't materialize this year, uh, how should investors navigate when investing in the global markets, considering its relative outperformance in 2023 and year-to-date 2024? Should investors take profit or stay invested? Over to you, Mr. Andrew. Hi, thanks. Uh, I think our base case is actually for only one rate cut this year. Of course, uh, economic data may not actually justify for two rate cuts that consensus seems to be expecting. La. But the performance of global markets year to date has actually only been driven by a few factors. One is favorable earnings. Uh, two is optimism about soft landing for the US economy. Three is expectations of the rate cuts. And fourth is, of course, excitement about AI. Now, if we look at the US, for example, the S&P has gone up 15 over percent, driven by a handful of stocks due to AI theme. Same, when you look at Taiwan, the Thai X has gone up by 25% uh, due to tech as well as AI. So other markets that have gone up double digit this year, India, for example, have been driven by a strong pace in economic growth, which follows through on robust earnings growth. And of course, Malaysia, right? have been driven by political stability and supportive government policies. So we have the, <clears throat> we have the view that rate cuts, whether they happen or not, would not substantially affect market performance this year. Lah. So instead, our investment decisions, uh, whether they take profit or stay invested, 
depends on valuations and whether they are further growth catalysts to each market. And, this, and lastly, of course, everyone is looking at Trump, right? Uh, to see how the Trump trade will pan out. Okay, uh, that's uh, short and sweet. Um, Tianjin, what do you think uh, on the red card? Whether we will see any red card uh, coming in in probably September or do you think uh, the September red card is not likely to happen? Yeah, so on the red card view, um, entering September Fed, Fed meeting, we think if if there's no fluctuation or any upside surprise on inflation, it's likely that um Fed would do a one rate cut to um to to pay pace out what their interest rate cut plans into twenty twenty five, and your question regarding if there's no rate cut, what should we do in terms of investment action? I think if you could recall at the beginning of the year, market is looking at six to seven rate cuts. And now we are we are getting only one to two rate cuts by end of 2024. So regardless of that decline in rate cut expectations, we are still seeing um, all the global equity markets hitting all-time highs in US, in um, Europe, UK, as well as Japan. Um, the reasons being that the underlying earnings um, growth is still strong. So we think that it, it's very difficult to time the market, especially for individual investors who are not uh, closely monitoring um, every actions in, in the market. We think that um, being in, involved in the market actively is, is the right choice and try to hold your investment horizon in a longer period. You, you will ride right through the wave and sticking with all the uh, high quality companies that can operate better and also adapt to that um, elevated rate environment to kind of compete well and gain more market shares to their smaller competitors. We see that opportunities to keep supporting the, their, their earnings growth um, going into 2025. So in essence, we think that investors should kind of keep a longer time horizon lines where there's a lot of discussions around the uh, rate cuts because rate cuts is one of the factors but not just the sole factor to drive a uh, market higher right uh, thank you Tianjun. Uh, mr hang Tua, are we on the same camp that we think uh september rate cut is likely and if it doesn't happen how uh should investors navigate along these uh uncertainties Sorry, Mr. Hang Tua, you are muted. Okay. All right. Thanks, uh, Kim So I believe there's two minimum two rate cuts this year. So based, basically, I mean, that's uh, from the perspective of my view, there'll be two minimum two rate cuts. And I think the market is expecting two plus another 60% of the third rate cut. I think the reason is because um, you know, the data from the from, from the US is not good in terms of, um, in terms of I mean, infl despite inflation is still high, you have the labor market, you have the... Um, commercial real estate issues in the U.S. and you have the uh, consumer demand tapping out in the U.S. But again, um, the question, and I feel uh, that there'll be at least a two great cuts and they'll come in a surprise by the Fed. But apart from that, I mean, your question is whether or not um, if there's no rate cut, what would investors do? So for me, um, the rate cut will be, will be coming either this year or next year. So if there's no rate cut this year, eventually the rate cuts will be coming next year. So how would the investors uh, prepare for the for, for for this kind of scenario where there's no rate cut this year. So my view is, if there's any uh, um, uh, gains um, currently uh, in your portfolio in terms of market market gains, you should just take it off the table. Not entirely, but at least maybe part of it, half of it. That's my view. It's it's better to actually have gains on your. I mean, basically to, uh, have gains on your hand rather than you know being there on on the market market basis like. So uh, second of all, if you want to be defensive, probably you should go into more. Uh, sectors more defensive like consumer, uh, 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 retail consumer. So those are the sectors I'll be looking at to actually uh, put my money in for the time being while waiting for the rate cuts to materialize. Um, I think in terms of um, and also fixed income. Um, if if you have no exposure to income, this is the time for you to actually go long fixed income. Uh, despite I mean uh, in uh, for local markets, I think uh, the the MGS the local bond market is still um, a, a flattish since uh, early this year. Uh, 
despite waiting for the red cards to happen, which didn't, didn't materialize. But eventually, I believe, I think going forward, it will materialize either next year. So if you are into fixed income, we should be uh, invested in fixed income, maybe probably long duration. And when the time comes, when the, when the actual cuts comes, um, fight to cut, bank will then eventually cut, and you will be riding the capital gain on the fixed income side as well. So that's my view. All right, thank you, Mr. Hang Tua. So we see uh, different, uh, different opinions here. Uh, like Andrew say, we, we have to look at the valuation. Tianjin states that we need to stay invested. And Mr. Hang Tua suggests that probably uh, we need to uh, uh, we need to uh, look at uh, profit taking and probably switch to switch our our uh, assets to some of the defensive uh, sectors or even defensive asset classes. But of course, ultimately, uh, it really depends on the investor preference and the risk profile. So uh, for those that are not sure like what to do and where to do, I think here is how we can help. So probably I think back to uh, Andrew, just now since we are talking about valuation, uh, if you notice that uh, U.S. valuations are not as cheap as those of its uh, Asian peers, and a significant portion of the S&P 500 return this year and last year have been driven by, uh, like you say earlier, uh, the mega cap stocks uh, rally in the U.S., a tech rally as well as the AI frenzy trends. So do you foresee any potential for flows or profit taking moving out of the U.S., probably to Asia, and which part of Asia will benefit? Okay, I think the key driver of the U.S. market for the second half of the year is actually U.S. elections, All right? Especially the Trump trade. So if Donald Trump wins, as he is widely expected to, then we may see actually a further lift to U.S. stocks this year. If that happens, that may, that may actually delay any flows out of the U.S. as investors prefer Wall Street. Yep. Totally agree on that. Seems that uh, now geopolitics have actually overshadowed uh, the fundamentals or even the valuation. So, Tianjuan, do you share the same opinion? Do you see uh, any uh, you know, potential flows uh, out of the US or do you think likely uh, US continue to will register uh, you know, all-time high levels? Yeah, so currently if you look at S&P 500 valuation, obviously it has related um, to a level that's higher than historical average and hence it's reflected on the all-time high performance. So if you look at S&P 500 PE multiples, it used to be trading at um, 15, 16 on average and PE multiples and now we are seeing around 21, 22 times PE multiples. However, like you, you um, Andrew and you mentioned on the MAX7 performance year to date, if we exclude the MAX7 of the S&P 500, the P multiples are actually only at 16, 17 times. So it's not really expensive on the surface level and we could expect your know, market to broaden out if we see a soft landing and and the economy to recover um, into 2025. So on, on that front, I think US market and the companies with um, high quality and global exposures could still um, remain favorable in terms of the capital returns. But when, when we talk about outside of US, um, I don't have a clear answer of whether there'll be a huge or significant outflows of US, but there are still a few um, interesting markets outside of US, for example, in Japan, we could see the corporate structures that the, the domestic um, in, in, in index regulator kind of in, in, introduced the corporate governance reform where a lot of the companies started to return more capitals um, to the investors and also to be more efficiently utilizing their capitals for um, um, their business investments. So this Japan market is also an area that we, we think um, they are changing um, meaningfully and structurally better. So we will closely monitor given that their P multiples is only at 15 times for a good reason because for the past decades, they are in a zero inflationary um, environment. And if we could expect the inflation to be more sustainable going forward, we could start seeing 
um, better business operations in, in Japan. And also there are a lot of global companies that are in Japan that could also be like US. All right, thank you, Tianjuan. Uh, looks like the developed market equities, uh, the likes of US and Japan will continue to garner investors' interest. Uh, Mr. Hang Tua, do you share the same view that uh, you foresee any you know, uh, potential flows of profit-taking moving out of the US since US valuation is not cheap anymore? Sorry, John. Okay, um, I agree, Andrew. Uh, this year... The second half is basically about the Trump election, the U.S. election, and most likely, I think, 90% that uh, Trump will win the elections. I think that there's, there's no denying that. Lah. But so, but again, to me, I have to differ in terms of what who Trump is right now in this coming uh, presidency versus who he was in the previous, uh, when he was first time elected as U.S. president. So I think to be realistic, he knows he's a businessman, first of all. So basically... You know, all this rhetoric about him, about uh, 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 when he becomes uh, the, the second time uh, president imposing like a 10 or 60 percent tariffs on China's exports and, and whatnot, and you know, trying to bring back jobs in the US. I, I, I don't think that is a realistic um, uh, scenario for him as well as, uh, as, as, as for the world, because that would definitely destroy all the global trades and whatever we have, whatever the, the, the world has actually developed for the past 40 years, 30, 40 years since we have the uh, WTO. So to me, there'll be some uh, flows out of the US, definitely, and the country that will definitely benefit, definitely China, India, as well as Southeast Asia. So in terms of uh, uh, in terms of why are these countries in, in particular, definitely China. China is basically, despite the sanctions, um, they are still developing their own economy. They are still, de are still developing their own consumer, basically, uh, uh, demand. So basically, China is a market that we, we that definitely investors globally cannot ignore, despite whatever rhetoric in terms of uh, the possible sanctions to, to be imposed by the US or, or, or even uh, the EU on, on, on China. China is still the country to, to look at and the country to be invested in. I mean, you can see all, despite all the rhetoric by the EU leaders uh, on, on, uh, on, China, on China, all the businessmen from the EU are still coming over to China to actually set up plans manufacturing invest, and, and still invest in China. So there's some one country you cannot ignore. So the second hour is India, definitely India, uh, where they are, you know, they are very well, they are very capable of uh, attracting all the investments for the past few years. And that's where, uh, I mean, global uh, investors are also keen to invest in. And thirdly, Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia alone, I mean, for this year, we have in Malaysia, our country. Basically, we have political stability and therefore uh, one of the factors uh, that is driving global uh, in, uh, investors into the um, uh, into the country, and that's something we have to look at. Now, apart from that, we have all these um, the government's uh, 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 implementation of all this uh, subsidy rationalization and all those um, uh, new new sorry, renewable energy initiatives. All those initiatives that actually been presented in the past, and if they are able to actually implement those initiatives, at least maybe um, not half, uh, maybe 80, 70 percent of it. They will be actually be very positive uh, signal for investors and definitely actually investors in going forward as well. So I think these three countries, as I mentioned, China, India, and Southeast Asia, in particular Malaysia, are those countries which investors should uh, uh, investors should look at when before they decide to invest. All right, thank you, Mr. Hang. A very uh, comprehensive answer. Uh, before talking about Malaysia, uh, since we briefly uh, touched on you know uh, U.S. China trade tension. Uh, another geopolitical risk that we see is uh, potential tensions or conflicts that we see in the Middle East. Uh, Mr. Andrew, do you think uh, this tension will continue to escalate or remain at its current level? And because uh, the tensions or the conflicts in the Middle East will continue to have an impact on the oil prices and hence inflation as well as the financial markets. Over to you, Andrew. Hey, uh, we do not think that the conflicts in the Middle East will escalate. Lah. I think oil prices will you know, ultimately be determined by fundamental con conditions, inventory levels, as well as OPEC policies. Lah. So as for now, we expect oil price to remain steady as demand from China and prospects of higher supply from key producers, they actually counter the risk from geopolitical tensions. Lah. 
Okay, thank you, Andrew. So, uh, Tianjuan, do you think uh, the the conflicts in Middle East will continue to escalate and probably that may complicate the Fed's policy path moving forward given uh, its relative uh, uh, you know, significance on the inflation? Yeah, so to the first part of your question, we do not have hold a view on whether the Middle East tension would escalate or not, but um, a better way to think of it is if we to chart and x axis and y axis, x axis as the timeline and y axis as the the tension level. I would say it will be more fluctuate in a in a range, um, over the period because um, it it's it's not easy to fix and over the near term it will be more so of a long term impact. But in terms of um that tension impact on the oil price and inflation and what. Uh, it could impact or change Fed's action. We don't think there's much um, impact coming from um, the Middle East because if we think about the oil price, uh, that's basically being driven by supply and demand dynamic. So demand is nothing related to that tension. So it's more so of a supply. And that tends to be more of a near-term supply impact coming from the Middle East tension. So in the end, I will agree with uh, what Andrew just mentioned. Um, we have to look at the supply and demand dynamic. And at, at this point, we are seeing quite stable um, supply and demand dynamic. And hence, we are also expecting the oil price, the brand crude oil price to be quite range bound between 80 to $85 um, into 2025. And, and we do not expect uh, a, a, a lot of surprise. And even if there's surprise, we think that we, it wouldn't change any long-term um, strategy for investment. It would be more so of a near-term market noises um, for investment. Right. Um, thank you, Tianjun. So uh, probably we should stay invested and ignore the short-term noises. So Mr. Hang Tua, looks like the market performance, um, sorry, looks like the market uh, response towards uh, all these conflicts in the Middle East has been muted. In October, we see uh, during the Israel-Hamas conflict, you know, the US bond yield actually surged to 5% level, but Im uh, immediately it corrected to below that level, and that's been supportive of the recovery moving forward. And similarly, in April, we see, uh, you know, uh, Israel-Iran conflict, uh, market did react, but quickly recover and continue to register all-time high levels. So do you think that, uh, you know, the tensions or conflicts in the Middle East will continue to escalate? And how should investors uh, navigate along uh, these uh, challenges? In terms of, continue, uh, sorry, oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. in terms of the conflict, I, I believe that it, uh, basically, when 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 the new U.S. president, most likely Trump, uh, gets into office, probably you know again he's a businessman. He doesn't want to see conflict. He'll probably you know uh, this uh, basically uh, not good for business. That's number one. So basically, in a way, I expect things will settle down. I mean, gradually settle down after he comes into office. Maybe the tension will actually de-escalate, probably you know, into quarter one next year. So that's I believe, and therefore, and uh, as well as again based on the data uh, globally. As well as in the US, coming up from the US, I expect things uh global coming growth will actually slow down. All right, all right, probably next year. So in that case, all of them will, go, will weaken as well. And therefore, despite the conflict and, and as mentioned by uh Tian Jun, um uh, you know, the fluctuation in the oil price in, in short term, I expect oil price to actually decline going forward because mainly driven by the lower demand for oil due to uh, slow economic growth globally. That's what I believe in. So looking at the oil price between $17 and $18 per barrel on the average next year. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hang Tua. Uh, back to you, Mr. Andrew. Uh, since we are on geopolitics, uh, the topic of de dollarization is quite pertinent in the current geopolitical landscape. Uh, more countries are considering joining BRICS, uh, stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, and are moving away from reliance on the US dollar. And this trend reflects a broader desire to reduce dependence on the dollar for international trade and finance. So the question here is, Will the US dollar eventually lose its ground? What's your view? Hey, I think de-dollarization uh, can be actually described as countries moving away from dollar as a reserve currency as well as a medium of exchange. Now, currently, we all know that dollar still holds dominant position. I think it accounts for maybe 60% of global reserves. Uh, our view is that if it happens, 
uh, in international trade, it will be a slow process. I mean, you can't just change things overnight, right? And the implications depend on the speed of the US dollar decline as well. A more plausible scenario to me would be a continued slide in US dominance, US dollar dominance, but at a gradual pace. Okay, Mr. Andrew. So, uh, Mr. Hang Tua, uh, do you think that uh, dollar will eventually lose its ground because of this de de-dollarization trend? What's your view? Sorry, uh, you're muted. I agree, Andrew. It's a gradual process. Probably not in the next two, three years, but more, more, more like 10 years, right? You can see it. Probably more than 10 years. In probably 10 years, you can see actually feel that Dollar, the dollar will be declining. By near term, two, three years, you won't feel a difference. The reason why, you know, as mentioned, um, dollar forms 60% of the global central bank reserve, number one. Number two, it actually forms about 88% or 80 to 88, 88% of the trade in dominating dollars. That's number two. And, you know, because of the financial linkages, the the, the global banks and interpolations, it's still the dominant uh, currency, right? So you can't, you can't, you can't just simply push dollar, US dollar out of uh of the circulation because of that dominance. So yeah, I believe the dollar will be around the next five years, at least five years. But then again, and you have uh, on the other side of the of the global south, you have the Russia, China, and and the rest of the global south and BRICS trying their best actually to uh, not use dollar and uh, use uh, one. So we can see, especially this year and and especially next year, yuan trading will be increasing significant among Asian countries, right? But not, you know, not in the, the other side of the world, G7 and yeah. So I, I know that's why my view, dollar will still be dominant, but at the same time, yuan will be increasingly dominant in this part of the world. So increasing, you can see our central banks, our, our, our what do you call it, the, the, the yuan ringgit uh, line will be increased for, possibly to, 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 to deal with the increasing yuan trade. And other countries, maybe the PBOC will also grant uh, um, the yuan lines to other countries who want to increase their trade in yuan as well. So we can see that the increasing uh, importance of yuan in this side of the world in terms of trading. That's what I did. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hang Tua. So uh, now back to local Malaysia market, uh, probably the last question on geopolitics. Uh, Malaysia's foreign policy has always uh, remained neutral amid geopolitical tension. Uh, Mr. Andrew, do you see this a boon or a pain? Hey, neutral is actually good, especially when you have two superpowers uh, like US and China not seeing eye to eye. Okay, you don't want to stand on one either side and be collateral damage. Lah. Okay, now, if you look at what's happening, companies have actually been moving out of China to manufacture in Malaysia to avoid some tariff being imposed on goods coming out of China. We are already seeing that happening for the last uh, 24, 12 to 18 months, um, you know, especially in the technology semicon space. We also believe that this uh, diversification of global semicon uh, supplier base as well as production locations will continue. And Malaysia is actually a prime beneficiary of trade diversion. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Andrew. So, uh, Mr. Hang Tua, do you see a boon or bane that uh, Malaysia has always been neutral amid all this geopolitical tension, especially between US and China? I think, uh, sorry, okay. I think Malaysia and as well as ASEAN has always been neutral. That's the policy of the ASEAN country for the past since it was established um, years ago, right? ASEAN has been very neutral in terms of um, the uh, geopolitics. Uh, I mean, since we call the Cold War, right? Since the Cold War, when it was, uh, since it was established, and and, and, they are, our, and ASEANs and as well as Malaysia's stand is at least neutral. We don't side to, we don't actually choose sides like the, like the US uh, or, or say uh, Russia or, or the other, uh, in those days was the USSR. So now it is a boon to me. Um, then again, in terms of, as mentioned by Andrew, in terms of our, uh, we actually, because of that the policy, We've been benefiting, especially this year. I mean, especially since last year and this year, uh, in attracting all these uh, in invest foreign investments, especially in the US as well as China, right? So we are actually, uh, in a way, I to uh, our our politicians quite good in, in making that being neutral uh, without change sides. But end of the day, in the, especially in terms of the semiconductor industry, we are still at the in a way the low 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 chain uh, set a part of the the semiconductor industry. 
but we have to be careful because when 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 eventually we want to move up the chain, right? Uh, from the smoker from the lower ladder to the middle or even the higher. That's where 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 things might not we might not be able to be neutral anymore. So once we go to the middle or the, or the higher level of the semicon, that's where it is, all this sensitivities needs to be be carefully thought out. So that was what I can see the, from from US sanctions on China to prevent them to actually manufacture those high end parts of the semicon industry. So for Malaysia, at the moment we are okay because we are probably still at the lower chain. But once we move out to the middle or the the, the high end, then we need to be careful in terms of how we're going to play the politics. That's all oh, right. So, yeah, looks like uh, both uh, the tech sectors and probably industrial sectors could benefit uh, amid uh, the geopolitical tension uh, between US and China. So uh, since we are also uh, talking about Malaysia and we see that some of the sectors that have done well this year and last year, like property, utilities, con Construction, uh, Andrew, do you think these sectors will continue to do well? And what are the teams that we should put our money uh, in? Okay, I think the three sectors that you name uh, are actually all interrelated. I mean, for example, mm. you know, property demand is a is a supported by economic growth, catalytic mm. uh, infrastructure infrastructure developments, in and that will lead to investment by data centers, E and E players. Mm. And of course, now you have this upcoming detailed announcement on the Johor Singapore Special Economic Zone, plus the possible revival of the KL HSR, that could mm. spur further uh, interest like property plays. Now, mm. if you link that together, you also see that the Johor Singapore Special Economic Zone is actually going to be a game changer for Johor. All right, there is actually a strong impetus from both Malaysia and Singapore to make it work. All right, we 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 when it happens, we're gonna see greater economic integration. There'll be freer movement of people, goods, and capital, and therefore that will uh, open up fresh opportunities lah, in terms of long term policy goals. Now, when you have property development, immediately you need infrastructure, and what we have seen is actually the proliferation proliferation of uh, data centers. Uh, which again has a spillover effect on supporting industries, say like you know utilities, water, and the supporting uh, industries, and again infrastructure. Now, yes, you as you know, there's been an announcement uh, by the prime minister recently that Malaysia has actually approved about 114.7 billion worth of investments in data centers and cloud services between 2021 and 2023. So we think that this. Whole whole DC investment cycle is just at the uh, initial stages and we expect much more land transactions to happen. Sir. So therefore, developers with solid balance sheet uh, will start to benefit from the viability of this DC-related uh, real estate investment. So again, in a nutshell, all three sectors are related. Mm. Yeah, I do agree as yeah, well with yeah. Andrew on, on, on that as well. So far for, for us, we are, we are still positive, although these sectors have actually gone up quite a bit this year, but we're still positive there's some uh, some growth there, uh, especially in terms of renewable energy players, uh, selected industrial companies, semicon, constructions, as I, I mean, all these are related like data centers and healthcare as well. So to me, um, yeah, these are all related in terms of what Andrew is saying uh, going forward. There's still some growth there, although they've been running, uh, they've been, um, incre uh, been, they been performing quite well uh, in the first half as well. Yeah, and also we are looking to actually um, uh, perhaps not uh, since a lot of the small caps been actually um, running quite 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 a bit, uh, especially some of the ace market uh, uh, stocks as well. So our premise towards more towards large cap stocks and more liquid stocks for the second half run. Right? In a way, it's a more defensive move from uh, from in my view. Yeah, that's all. That's all we have. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hang Tua. So, looks like the outlook of former Malaysian market appears very positive. Uh, Tian Juan, maybe back to you. Uh, since you are only uh, managing uh, global funds, uh, you are not managing uh, local funds. So, from a global asset manager perspective, what's your view on Malaysia? Would you increase your uh, you know, allocation to Malaysia or are you actually looking uh, you know, to, to investing into Malaysia-related uh, names in your portfolio? 
Um, so just for clarifications for our global investment, we do um, develop market. So Malaysia as an emerging market is, is not part of our investment. Okay, so um, so uh, recently maybe uh, we can also talk about uh, you know recently uh, we 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 see there are, there are a lot of talks uh, from global asset managers like you know even J P Morgan they have also upgraded you know Malaysia from underweight to neutral at least right so the outlook for Malaysia market appears uh very very positive so uh Andrew back to you uh moving forward uh what are the catalysts that you see uh in the market that will continue to you know catalyze uh you know the market activities probably you know EPF account tree withdrawal do you see that uh uh bringing positive impact to market okay since you have two questions so the first question is what's going to drive the market will be political stability earnings growth and all the announced uh, policies from last year being executed this year. I think that would be the drivers for the Malaysian market. On your question on account tree, I think if you look at the reported number, I think end of June, there were about three over million EPF members have transferred about 11 over billion to account tree, of which about 7.8 billion has been withdrawn. So that averages about uh, ringgit 2450 per member. Lah. Now the impact, is if evident if you look at the retail trade index, uh, it is up about 6.8%. Mm. Uh, but we think that this is just a temporary booster. You know, it's it's a temporary booster. It is not a real uh, catalyst for a consumption lift. Uh. I think that will only happen uh, when we have increase in payroll growth. I think uh, there are talks that uh, there will be upcoming uh, government salary increases. I think when that happens, it will be more impactful because this is ongoing. Whereas uh, this EPF tree is one off and the scheme is again much smaller than the other schemes that were announced previous years. Okay, uh, thank you, Andrew. So uh, back to you, uh, Mr. Hang Tuan. Do you, do you think there are any other you know, investment teams that investors should probably put their money in? Maybe, you know, just now uh, Mr. Andrew mentioned about EPF account tree may not have a big impact. Probably, you know, the, the salary hike in the civil service could have a better impact. So in that scenario, like what are the teams that we should actually look at for the rest of the year or even back, uh, even moving into 2025? In terms of teams, I think that to me, the, the same thing will actually still play out whatever teams I've been uh, playing on this year, we continue to actually pay out next year, which includes um, um, data centers, properties, uh, utilities, which is support the data centers as well. So the same thing will actually still play out next year. But what maybe, this is probably an additional team that we can look at is healthcare, like, something that um, maybe not as prominent this year, but I believe will be more prominent next year if, you know, if what, whatever the, some, uh, the potential play out next year like, in terms of new disease or whatever. So in terms of the account tree, I agree with Andrew. Like, this, this is just a one-off. Uh, what I mentioned earlier, what actually can sustain domestic demand is actually actual growth in terms of jobs, in terms of payroll, in terms of uh, income, real income, right? Uh, after adjusting for inflation. So that's uh, the, 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 the more critical component which can drive consumer demand in, in domestic as well as GDP growth going forward. Now. That's my view. All right, that's great. Looks like everything is very, very positive in Malaysia. Andrew, are there any sectors that you think uh, you, 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 you will be underweight on? Um, I think two sectors that are lacking catalyst and earnings growth would be uh, plantation as well as telco. La. I think that much is very evident. Uh, even judging by stock prices, you know, they have been like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with Andrew. Yeah. Um, but plenty, yeah, I mean, telecoms, we talk about the, the second 5G network, they will actually um, basically take away a lot of capital, KPEX from the, from, from the telco themselves. So it will probably a drag on their profits. That's one. Uh, and in terms of um, uh, the uh, plantations, yeah, it's, it's still a drag on the profit this year. But then again, again, uh, we expect uh, weaker economic growth next year. Again, they will drag uh, the, the, sea, the plantation sector will still be a drag next year as well, given the uh, uh, weaker 
global economic growth to uh, translate into weaker demand as well as you know weaker profits for, for the for the plantation companies. Yeah. All right, thank you, Mr. Hang Tua. So uh, before we end the session today, allow me to do a quick summary. Uh, looks like uh, this year, uh, global equities will continue to uh, register a, a good year ahead, um, driven by, you know, uh, trends in AI and also, you know, uh, possible Trump re-election could also catalyze the market. But some of the risks that we need to continue to stay watchful on is on the geopolitical risk, probably between US and China or even the Middle East uh, tensions. Hope that uh, it won't escalate further. And back home, uh, we see uh, property utilities, construction, even tech uh, continue to gather interest. Um, Foreign investors, they, they, they now start to look at Malaysian market because of our political certainty as well as, you know, uh, strong economic fundamentals. So before we end the session today, uh, probably uh, we can uh, have Andrew to share some of the products offered by uh, M, right, that can help investors navigate along the evolving investment landscape, followed by uh, Tianjin from Nomura and Mr. Hang Tua from PMB Invest. Over to you, Andrew. Hi, uh, there are currently actually four funds that our house is recommending. Lah, and they are EPF, MIS approved. Lah, so it makes it easier. Uh, as we have mentioned earlier, we are bullish on the Malaysian market. So the two funds that will benefit from it will be M Dividend Income. I think the name implies that it's dividend based. Uh, the other one is a pure Malaysian M Malaysia Equity Fund. And of course, the third fund, if you are Islamic, uh, Sharia compliant, then we recommend M Islamic balance. Mm. Now, for the global uh, scenario, mm. we actually allocate M dynamic allocator. Now, M dynamic allocator is different because the returns are actually generated through investments in CIS, which is collective investment schemes, as well as ETFs. So they can invest in various asset classes. Uh, you know, not limited by, you know, a certain percentage in equity or fixed income. And the actual allocation process is based on the manager's ongoing assessment of the macroeconomic trends in the global as well as local markets. So I think these four funds in general would uh, suit the theme that we are discussing this afternoon. Thank you, Drew. Over to you, Kenjian. Uh, yes, so for Nomura, we have five funds, but I would, I would like to highlight three funds. So for investors with higher risk appetite and higher risk tolerance, there will be Nomura Global Sharia Sustainable Equity Fund. It's an ESG fund and um, you gain long-term capital return um, alongside with ESG uh, growth drivers to support the, the company earnings growth. And the second one for the higher risk appetite will be our Nomura Global Sharia Sustainable, uh, Global Sharia Semiconductor Agri Fund. Um, as reflected on the name, it's a sector fund. It focuses on global semiconductor where you would um, invest in the global developed market um, semi fund. Uh, semi fund semi companies like Nvidia, Broadcom, TSMC, and the lights. And for those who have lower risk appetite and would like to take more of a defensive stance, we also highlight our strategic growth fund. It's a multi asset strategy fund which invests in both um global equity as well as um the fixed income, um Sharia fixed income. So this would be the three. Um, funds we would like to highlight uh, depends on the investor's appetite, uh, risk appetite level. All right, thank you, Tian okay. And over to you, Mr. Hang Tua. Okay, um, from TNB investment perspective, uh, we would like to highlight actually four funds, two of those and local. One is um, uh, Sharia Aggressive Fund for local as well as, um, um, uh, sorry, uh, for Sharia Equity Fund. Those are uh, the funds that are invested locally, domestic. As and for the global fund, we have uh, the Sharia ESG Global Equity Fund, uh, as well as the uh, Sharia Global Equity Fund. One is ESG Global Equity, and one is actually a uh, Global Equity Fund. So that's for the four funds we actually highlight. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Hantua. So there are a lot of uh, funds uh, available. Uh, 
uh, on our platform, uh, on Philip Mutual Berhad, or even on Philip Capital Management, uh, Sanyam Berhad itself. So ultimately, uh, whether you are a defensive investor, you are a growth-oriented investor, we are always uh, happy to assist, uh, to, to, to uh, help you to achieve uh, your, your long-term investment objective. I think uh, that's all for our today's uh, discussion. We would like to express our sincere gratitude to Mr. Andrew Sia from uh, M Invest, Mr. Lee Tianjian from Nomura Asset, and Mr. Hang Tua from PMB Invest. Thanks for your insightful sharing today, and we hope to see you again. And thank you also to the audience uh, for supporting our roundtable event today. Right, so see you in the next uh, Philip Roundtable. This update is brought to you by Philip Capital, your partner in finance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.